Hi, welcome back to the breadboard. It's Tuesday today, so what does that mean? TI Tuesdays, and we're kicking the very first TI Tuesday off by looking at a TI op amp and an application note from Texas Instruments. So let's first off go to the PC and have a look at the application note, and uh, then we'll come back to the bench on a breadboard and actually implement some of the examples that are in the op amp uh, application note from TI so that I can show you what it actually looks like on a DMM or an oscilloscope so that you can see how things behave for real. This is um, happening because I've had lots of questions from my power supply project and various other things about why certain things work the way they do and why other things uh, may not work properly. Anyway, it's, it's all about the understanding of an op amp and how it is going to work with various configurations, whether it's set up as an integrator, a non-inverting amplifier, an inverting amplifier, differential amplifier, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there's a lot more in the application note than what I'm going to cover, but I will link it in so that you can have a look for yourself. And then I will um, go through some of the basic examples where they will help us understand what we're doing with our power supply project or where we're doing some small signal amplification and things like that. So let's get to the app note. So this is the application note I was speaking of. It's actually an application report from Texas Instruments. It's dated back to 2001, um, written by Bruce Carter and R, uh, Thomas R. Brown. Um, the I'm not going to go through every word of what's in here. I'm just going to skip to various sections and then we're going to drop across to the breadboard to actually try out some of the circuits. So the first thing I'm going to do is we're just going to scroll down to the initial part of the detail of the document. So standard op amp types. We've got a buffer, which is uh, an amplifier where the input and output is either just simply inverting or non-inverting. This is drawn as it would be expected as a non-inverting buffer. We have a differential amplifier, which is your standard op amp. And then we have a differential input and differential output op amp here, which is we're not going to look at that in this series at the moment. Um, so what we're going to focus on is this traditional op amp right here in the middle. So op amps these days come in all sorts of different packages from standard dip type packages or ceramic down to surface mount technology and really, really small packages. The one we're going to be using today is in what we call a P-dip plastic package and the dip means dual inline packaging as well. So it's plastic with dual um, sets of pins that can plug into a socket or a PCB or something. Um, and so, you know, if you're not using an op amp from TI or the board you've got has got an op amp from a different vendor and you want to plug one in from Texas Instruments or uh, somewhere else that's not the exact same part number, chances are uh, it will still fit in and still work correctly. There's a few things you'd have to look out for, but um, as a general rule, you could plug in a number of different types of op amps into the same circuit and it will still work. The things that would limit it would be things like the output impedance, its frequency response, uh, noise levels and things, which are all uh, determinable by looking at the data sheets. This is the op amp that we're going to actually use. It's a TL082 is the one that I have that we're going to use. This has um, got JFETs on the inputs. I'm just using this one because I happen to have it and it's the almost most common one that I have. It's low noise and very high input impedance, but outside of that, it's a fairly standard op amp. So you can see here, it's the same um, pinout diagram as we saw on the uh, tech sheet. And here is the TL082 package. It's actually got two op amps in the one package, but we're just going to use one of them for the moment. And you can see, so pin one is the output, pin two, it, two is the minus input, pin three is the plus input. Uh, the negative input is on pin 4, the positive input is on pin 8, and then the other side, pins 5, 6, and 7, is the other op amp that's in the package. So here is the ideal operational amplifier. I've already spoken to it a little bit, so I'm not going to spend too much time doing it. And you can see here, the inputs here are shown as basically open circuit. They have infinite input impedance. And the output, so Z in is infinity, the output is zero impedance, and the gain is infinity. And E out equals zero when E in equals zero. All right. Now, all things being ideal, that's the way this would work. But I'm going to show you um, on the bench that that's actually not the case in reality. So you need to take certain steps to make things more stable and um, things like that. You don't normally use an op amp in its open um, 
gain anyway. So you shouldn't usually have so much of an issue. But there is a version of an RPAM called a comparator where it's simply looking at these two inputs and um, comparing them and then the output reflects either high or low based on which rate, you know, whether one of these is higher than the other or not. Uh, that's a special kind and you shouldn't use a regular op amp as a comparator because you can get lockup issues and depending on the common mode voltage that you're applying to the inputs, you can even get output um, reversal where the based on the voltages the output should be positive and it will go negative and I'll show you that as well on the bench when we go. Now this application report does um, go into a lot of detail about the reality of the inputs and output impedances and things like that of op amps as well but for all general purposes as I said beginning um, you should the formulas are all based on assuming that the input impedances are infinite the output impedance is zero and that you have an infinite gain. This allows us to keep the formulas that we're going to be using much, much simpler than what they would be if you had to factor everything else in. And even though you have the issue where there is, in reality, some input current and things like that, um, even if you're assuming zero, you can still get to fractions of a percent um, accuracy from the output to the input and things, or better with some of the new, more modern um, op amps that are available to you. The voltage follower. So this one, as you can see, there are no feedback resistors. The positive input, so let's just say we've put two volts on here, comes in and the output needs to do whatever it can to make the negative input be the same as the positive input. So it's going to simply go up to two volts as well and it's going to follow the input. Now you might think, what's the purpose of this um, circuit? Well, if your input impedance here is, say, uh, 10 mega ohms or more, then you're not going to be drawing any current. And your source here might be a voltage reference. It might be a very sensitive, low-powered um, environmental sensor, a strain gauge or something like that, that cannot draw, uh, tolerate any load on it in order for it to work properly. Well, a circuit like this would be able to have, you know, Piku amps input uh, current or, or less, you know, ideal op amp zero input uh, current. And the output, though, would be able to drive, say, 10 milliamps, 50 milliamps, 100 milliamps, depending on what uh, op amp you use. Let's get to the breadboard now and try out those three circuits, or three or four circuits. So we'll do the open loop gain, the um, voltage follower, so it's just a buffer. Okay, so we've already just spoken about uh, the ideal operational amplifier and open loop gain, zero imp uh, sorry, infinite input impedance and zero output impedance. So let's have a look at a real operational amplifier and see if we can see some of the effects of this um, ultra high gain and things like that and just have a look at what's happening. We'll try and do some measurements of current and uh, see what the output does when you vary the inputs uh, above and below zero with reference to each other. So the circuit I'm actually gonna do is, um, if we take a standard op amp, Okay, I'm going to put the plus input to a uh, potentiometer. Um, that's going to be plus 12 volts. I'm going to have minus 12 volts. It's going to go to the other end. And then this is going to be tied to zero volts. And we're going to put a uh, meter on the output and we'll put a uh, meter on the input as well. And we'll just see what happens. So ideally, it, based on what we've seen already, um, I, if I put a meter in there and measure, try and measure the current, we should see no current flowing or negligible current. Um, if I vary the plus above or below the minus, because of the infinite gain, the minute I get a, just a fraction above or below, the output should be swinging um, plus and minus to the rails or almost to the rails. So let's go and have a look and see if that actually happens. So here's the breadboard. I've got a um, plus 12 volts, minus 12 volts. Uh, this is a ground connection to pin two, which is the inverting input, and then the um, pin three, which is the non-inverting input, is connected to a potentiometer, which is going between the plus and minus 12 volt supply. 
um, I've got a, or will have a, sorry, do have a multimeter connected to the wiper of the pot so we can see what's happening there. And then another multimeter connected to the output. So let's um, just change the camera angle and see what happens as I start varying this pot. Okay, so the left hand Keysight multimeter is showing the input voltage and currently it's indicating uh, 0.6 volts and it's in the sorry minus 0.6 volts and as you can see here the negative rail or the output is sitting at near or close to the negative rail at minus 10.87 volts. So if I just gently adjust the potentiometer and slowly increase this towards zero, so it's about minus 0.3. 0 0.2, 0 0.1. It's only a single turn pot, so I don't have a lot of refinement on it. But I want to show you. See, now we've got 10 millivolts in the negative direction. The output is still zero. Oh, sorry, the output is still minus 10. We've got, sorry, now it's 10 millivolts. Now we've gone positive 550 millivolts and it's already flipping. You can see here, I'm just trying to get it as close to zero as I can with that pot. And you can see the output completely swings from one rail to the other. Um, and I'm just, I'm not even moving the pot. It's just enough that it's flipping. So this is showing you that the operational amplifier has a very, very high gain to it. Um, this particular one, I think, is in excess of, um, certainly in excess of 100 dBs, I believe. <clears throat> it could be as high as 160, which is basically 100 million gain. Um, but anyway, either way, as you can see here, just a few millivolts of difference is enough to swing the output from one rail to the other. One of the things I'm going to quickly show you while I have this configuration is what is what's called output reversal. So I'm going to increase the input towards the positive rail. And you can see the output is nothing happening with it now because it's already saturated. So it's 5 volts, 6, 9, 10, 11, 12. Right, that's perfectly fine. The output has stayed positive, which is what it should do. Now let's go in the other direction towards the negative rail. So you can see now the output has swung to minus 11 volts almost. Now I'm going to bring this down minus 6, minus 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. See what's just happened there? That's minus 10. I've got minus 11 volts on the input. Now it's only the obviously the supply rails go to minus 12. The pot can't take the input any worse than the supply rails. But as I approach the negative rail, the output reverses. And you'd have to look at the schematics and um, read more of the data sheets to see why that happens. And there are op amps that you can get that don't do this. Now, the other simple configuration that um, op amps can work in, which I'm, I'm not getting into the amplifier stage right now. So this is a, what I've just shown you. Another word for that, you know, because it's open loop gain and you're... And you're um, basically switching an input above or below the other input is it's working like a comparator. I just happen to have the comparison level set to zero volts because I tied this to zero. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, take this negative input now and instead of having it connected to zero, I'm going to actually have it connected to the output there. So now it's just going to work as a buffer or a um, a voltage follower and it's going to change the input impedance from high impedance which is the what the input is here to a low impedance output okay I have rewired the operational amplifier what I've done is I've taken the output now and I'm directly connecting it to pin uh, 2 so pin 1 and 2 are shorted together and the ground wire that I had on the negative input which was pin 2 has been removed. So now what you can see is that the input voltage is 0.25, uh, 0.285 and the output voltage is 0.284. Now let me just go to one rail up to, so we've, we've hit the rail there on the right hand side 11 and a half volts. See the input is now up to 12 but the output didn't go below above 11.5. That's one thing you've got to watch out for when you're designing systems is that you can't always go rail to rail with every op amp. Some of them have limitations of even as much as two or more volts away from the rails, the supply rails that is. So let's bring this down and at a certain point we'll see it there. So 11.3 in, 11.3 out, go down and down and down. And you'll see here, it's pretty much tracking it all the way. 6.76, 6.76, 11.3, 11.3, 11.3, 11.3, 
um, we're down into um, to go down to about one volt. So you got 1.11, you got 1.11. So this is just a buffer now. So we go negative, and you got minus 1.69, minus 1.69. Let's go down to about minus 10 volts now. All right, so we've got minus 10 on each. Now let's see if it's going to do this phase reversal again. So as we go down, there, yeah, it's done it again. So even as a uh, buffer where you've got 100% feedback to the negative input, so it's just a unity gain, it still has that phase reversal on the um, negative side of the rail. So that's, op so that's gone from open loop gain, which we had before, to now a complete uh, buffer, basically, which is um, a unity gain. Uh, in, I'm not going to do the uh, inverting amplifier or non-inverting amplifier with gain uh, coded into it with the resistors in this video. We'll do that for the next one. So to reconfigure this for what I was just describing to measure the input current, I'm going to leave it as a buffer uh, with this configuration. But my meter now, I'm going to take this off. And I'm going to break this and, and I'm going to put a meter in current mode between here and the input. Now, I have a Keysight 34470A, it's a seven and a half digit multimeter, that should be low enough to measure certainly down into uh, micro amps or pico amps as, as well for sure. Um, so if there is any detectable current going into there, we should be able to see it. So let me just rewire it and we'll go see. So what we're looking at here is the um, 34470A set in DC amps mode. I'm on the three amp input of the meter and it's also range down to uh, one microamp range. Uh, so what I'm gonna do just to start with, I've set the input to the op amp at basically zero volts, which would be the minimum current potentially flowing through. I'm just gonna short this out so that we can get an idea of uh, the current that may be just being introduced as noise and if I take the short off, so it's about two. I don't know if I can maybe null that out or not. All right, so that's basically short, nulled out the current flow where I've shorted out the meter um, as best I can. So let's just undo this. So we have about two nanoamps. So let's just adjust the pot and see what will happen. I'll call out the voltages as we do this. Um, so right now it's got basically um, 0.1 volts on the input and output because I've still got it in the, in the buffer mode. So I'm going to increase it to about plus 5 volts. So right there it's sitting at plus 5 volts. You can see there now that we've got um, a good 2 nanoamps flowing. If I take it back, back down to zero, it's still about two. So if I take it up to 10, 10 volts on the input roughly, you can see the current actually isn't, well there it's, it's what I've done there is I've actually gone to the rail. So, so it's a full 12 volts in and I've saturated it. You can see the current suddenly increased to 15 there. If I back it off a little bit, right there, you can see it's dropped down and very quickly it's reducing. So when you get near the rails, you start having issues with input current, but if you keep away from them, you don't. Now let's go to the negative rail where we had this lockup issue before and see what happens with that, because over the whole swing, it seems to be you know, no change in the input current really. So we're about minus four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We're at minus 10 volts. There. See that change? That's where it's gone phase reversal on the output. So I just put it back slightly above it. So the output's sitting at minus 10.8 volts right now. Um, backed it off just a tad more, 10.7 volts. You can see that's back to the two nanoamps that were being uh, going into that gate on the way up to the positive side, all the way down to this minus 10. Now if I just slightly go past the minus 10, minus 10.8, see how the current is massively now starting to increase. Right, up to the point where it's 3.5 microamps. So that's a huge increase in current because I've taken the negative input, sorry, the positive input down close to the negative rail. So uh, be aware of that when you're doing anything with your own op amp designs. And every type of op amp will behave differently, as I said. Um, some won't, you know, some may even fry if you 
take it that close to the negative rail because of internal circuitry and things you can end up with a lot of current flowing through if you don't limit it somehow right so it's still again it's sitting back there about two so it's not really you know i don't have the equipment to be able to easily measure the current i mean there's too much noise and everything else to be able to measure down at that level um, but i think you can agree there that there's there's pretty much no um, input current at all that's relevant going into this op amp um, i think if you did the math on that 10 volts at two nano amps it's going to be hundreds of or you know certainly tens of megs if not more and i think we have a quick look at this chip which is the as i said the opa uh, op82 um, we will find out that it's got a very very high input impedance because it is a fat input op amp so just while we're here let's just quickly check that for this device uh, so, sorry it's a tl082 is that what i've got on there one sec yes it's a tl082 so this is the right data sheet so you can see here it's talking about low input bias currents 50 pico amps um gain uh bandwidth of about four megahertz we're not going to go into a lot of the more details of this because uh, i'm going to keep, keep these videos simple and short high input impedance there so it's 10 to the 12 ohms input impedance the um signals we were probably measuring are probably noise being generated from my flying leads um, to, to measure that low you, you know you have to have the op amp screened i don't you know it's a switching power supply that's driving the op amp things like that so the last thing i want to quickly show you is what happens when you start changing the load on the output right now i've got no load on here so what i'm going to do is i have a um, set of resistors here uh, 100 ohms 1k 10k and things like that so i'm just going to put a um, load on here to get about 10 volts on the output and then i'll load it up with different resistors to see what happens okay so i've put a um, meters back the way they were so this left meter is showing the input volts and this right meter is showing the output volts now right now it's running as a buffer so the output should stay the same as the input i've picked roughly 10 volts to make it easy to uh, see what's going on so what i'm going to do is i'm going to um, connect the output to ground via initially a 10k resistor to see what difference it makes so let's just do this now I'm going to connect it now and as you saw there it made absolutely no difference to the output it didn't even flicker a tiny bit All right, i'm touching it on and off on and off and it's not making any difference at all to the output voltage so now let's change this to be a uh, that was a 10k so let's go down to 1k and see if that makes any difference all right so that dropped it a tiny bit it is having a very slight effect but it's still only you know four digits five digits in so it's still a negligible effect on it now remember the ideal op amp is supposed to have zero output impedance which means i should be able to go all the way down to say a one ohm and it still wouldn't have any impact but of course we know that's not going to be the case so now i'm putting 100 ohms now between ground and the output pin and there you see it's dropped it down to 2.7 volts so that has been uh, way too much for it now that's going to be uh, 100 ohms with 10 volts is going to be uh, basically 100 milliamps so that's way way too much i think this op amp is rated for about 20 or 30 milliamps so if i put in um, about three or four hundred ohms that should work so let me just see what i've got in my drawer and we'll give that a go to see if that's true okay so here's the last test i've got a 470 ohm resistor and that again is having no impact well 10.065 So it is having an impact 10.06665 so as you can see as i'm touching this and taking it off it is having an impact now the interesting thing is it's also impacting the input this one here is the input that's the output depending on your load and how the feedback is working it can affect the inputs as well so you can see that is having it's a minimal effect it's only uh, 10 percent one percent point one it's probably less than 0.05 percent impact on this particular op amp and that's a 470 ohm resistor so that's going to be 
uh, just a little over 20 milliamps that I'm pulling out of that at 10 volts. Um, you know, 100 ohms is too much load for full swing. 1K is fine and above. So uh, just, you know, every op amp again is going to be different. Uh, every model of op amp and everything that, that is. So uh, pick the ones that you need for your application. The other thing to remember, though, of course, is that the op amp is doing the amplifying for you. There's nothing to stop you putting a, um, a MOSFET or a power transistor or um, other circuitry on the output of an op amp in order to increase its output current capacity um, and minimize the load on the voltage side of things considerably. So um, just because your op amp doesn't have the output drive that you want, maybe for a low impedance load, for instance, if you were going to drive 50 ohms with this, um, you wouldn't be able to because, you know, as you saw, even with 100 ohms, it basically shut down the output to uh, only 2 or 3 volts. Um, but if you put a small transistor in the output as part of the output driving stage, then it would be able to uh, work correctly to a much, much wider range. Or you can use an op amp that has it built in already, or a power amplifier, um, which is, you know, you can buy them as single chip ones from TIs as well where they're designed to have, you know, up to even several amps of output drive current. Anyway, uh, that's the first part of this intro to op amps. I just wanted to cover off uh, the basics of how an op amp works, uh, what open loop gain does, what closed loop, um, basically unity gain, how it behaves, and one minor issue that you have to watch out for when you're using op amps, which is that phase reversal of the output uh, when you take the input close to the negative rail. Um, in future videos, we will look at, you know, taking uh, the negative input towards a positive rail and things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, most op amps that are um, designed not to do that will say so in the data sheets. And as we go through this, we'll, I will highlight any that I see that have that particular characteristic. Um, anyway, the next videos that we're going to do, we're going to start looking at uh, op amps as a uh, closed loop with uh, non-inverting and closed loop with inverting. This is where you would use the configuration mostly for uh, audio amplifiers, power amplifiers for a bench power supply, um, amplifying small signals because you can, once you start closing down this open loop gain, the op amp will become much, much more stable and its output impedance would effectively start uh, reducing down considerably as well. Right now what we saw here was a lower output impedance because we basically have a completely closed feedback so it's doing unity gain. If I was to do that same test without the feedback um, just by letting it go to one of the rails you'll probably see something very different. Um, but you know you can experiment yourself in that as well and the app sheet that we were looking at the application report actually goes into some details about that as well so please have a read. Um, the next video that I will be doing, as I said, is going to be on um, non-inverting and inverting and amplifiers. So where we have uh, proper feedback resistors and we actually can program the gain in by the ratio of the resistors and things.